Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. series on prayer here as a church and uh, prayer prayer is what we do I'm, I'm not trying to talk you into praying praying is what we do not just the religious but as human beings praying is what we do we pray because we're in a precarious situation last week we shared that our English word prayer comes from the Latin word precarious and we're in a precarious situation and that's what we do when we're in a pinch when we feel pressured we pray right? We're in a precarious situation. Costco's out of water and toilet paper, right? <laughs> Churches everywhere are serving communion with gloves on. You know, we're, we're in a precarious situation. We can either laugh or cry. We just, just will laugh this morning, right? Prayer uh, being this living, ongoing conversation with God, a sort of keeping company with God. And last week we emphasized that prayer wasn't simply getting things from God, like it's some sort of spell that we cast, but that prayer was really about getting to know God himself, that prayer, like most of the Christian disciplines, is a means to an end. So last week we talked about how prayer requires you to talk, to speak, to open up, and we talked about keeping it simple, keeping it real, and, and keeping it up. And, um, but it also requires, prayer requires that we listen. If this is an ongoing conversation, then prayer involves not just talking, but it involves uh, listening. I read this week that babies that are born deaf make just as many noises as babies who can hear. But then tragically, their speech trails off because they hear no response. So slowly but surely, they stop talking because they can't hear. And this has been my experience, is that our attempts at prayer quickly trail off. If there's no response. If we aren't hearing, we'll stop speaking. And certainly that's been true for me. And I'm guessing it's been true for you as well. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said the child learns to speak because his father or mother speaks to them. That's how we learn to speak is by hearing, by mimicking. He said, so we learn to speak to God because God has spoken to us and does speak to us. But, but how does this work? Like really, how do, we, how do we hear from God? And then how do you know it's God? And let's just be honest for a second that it can be difficult to speak to someone who's invisible And it can be hard to listen to someone who rarely speaks with an audible voice. How do we listen to what is most often not an audible voice, right? If you've got a Bible, would you turn with me to 1 Samuel 3? If you don't have a Bible, that's uh, no problem. We'll put it on the screen. In 1 Samuel 3, we'll read a wonderful example of an individual hearing from God. Samuel is a boy in this story. Samuel is a boy who is the result of prayer. His mother was barren and his birth was the result of prayer. And I know, I mean, if we open this mic up right now. I know that there are parents here who have children because 
they prayed. I bet everyone here knows of a barren womb being opened because of prayer. It's one of the things that God does. Samuel's mother, Hannah, uh, was, was barren. And there, there's, no, there's no one more persistent in prayer than a barren woman. And so she persisted in the place of prayer. She prayed with so much passion and heart that she was accused of being drunk. And even the priest said, could you chill out a bit? <laughs> you know you're going for broke when the pastor's like, easy, easy. So this is Hannah, this is Samuel's mother. Some of us have tasted that type of prayer, being that desperate in prayer that you could be accused of being drunk stumbling in prayer. Some of us know the realities of, of crying so hard that you feel hungover, headache and all. This was Hannah, Samuel's mother. So it says in the first few chapters of Samuel that she named him Samuel saying, because I asked the Lord for him. His whole life is the result of prayer. So she says, now I will give him to the Lord, for his whole life will be given over to the Lord. A little bit of what happened here this morning. Except Samuel was to be raised in the temple. That would be like Dom and Elise saying we dedicate Betty and Betty's going to grow up here. Mark's going to take her to Dickie's for lunch. and <laughs> She's just going to kind of manage around here be raised by the staff here at the church. When you, ra when you hear raised in the temple, you might think, oh, what a, what a sweet childhood growing up in the temple. But it was far from that for, for Samuel. In fact, it was like Samuel was a part of a reality show. There was quite a bit of dysfunction in the temple at that time. It, was, it wasn't just a happy place to grow. Starting in uh, verse 1 of, of chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple. He was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And then the Lord called to Samuel and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli. And he said, here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you, for you called me. But Eli said again, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called to Samuel again a third time. And he arose and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and he lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood calling, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak for your servant hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God 
and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. And Samuel lay until morning. He opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Don't hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The author is laying it on thick here to start. He says... That hearing from God was not something that was happening. The word is rare. It was rare that someone would hear from God. Hearing from heaven was not frequent. There was no frequent vision. The people of God were living without hearing him and they were living without vision. And this is the backdrop. This is the setting. This is the context for what God does with Samuel. Even Eli, he's the priest, right? He's supposed to see clearly, but his eyesight has grown dim. Obviously, it's symbolic, not just a physical eyesight, a sort of physical seeing, but a spiritual eyesight. A sort of spiritual perception that is not happening in the house of God. Even the leaders are blind, is what the author is meaning to communicate. Even those who are meant to see are not seeing. Even those who are both supposed to be saying this way are living in darkness. But it says that the flame is still flickering. But the lamp of God had not yet gone out. A smoldering wick he will not extinguish. All he needs is a little bit to work with, and that's what God does here. How often should we hear from God? That was a question I found myself asking this week. How often? How regular should this be? Because I fear that we read this story and we think, yeah, sounds about right. That we read this and read that the word of God was rare. That hearing from God was not something that was happening. And we're like, "Uh uh-huh, what's the problem? That sounds normal. How is it that silence and a shut up heaven has become normal and God speaking has become bizarre? That's weird. God spoke. I'm worried that the the author is setting something up and we're supposed to read it and go, oh no, something's terribly wrong. And instead we're like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm not sure if I see it. Silence is our norm. A shut up heaven is what we're used to. And God speaking is like, what was that? I'm not sure I can hear that. Well, I think there's a few reasons. The first might be an idea that the whole idea of hearing from God is just straight dangerous. It's it's not just infrequent. 
it's, it's really a dangerous thing. People who hear voices, they strap bombs to their chest. <laughs> so we're not totally interested in that. We don't really care what you heard. <laughs> That's dangerous, a bunch of people walking around claiming to have heard from God. Let's just go ahead and steer clear of that altogether. For others, hearing God isn't dangerous, but it's still just freaky and fringe. Like, maybe that'll happen once or twice in your life. If you're lucky. There is a God. He's up there, but he's wound this thing up down here. He's up there, we're down here, and this thing just kind of keeps ticking. And he doesn't intervene in those types of ways. He's distant, removed from his creation. And when he interjects, it's, it's, it's rare. It happens only a few times in someone's life. Another decision I think that we've made is that hearing God is for the elite. It's for the super spiritual. It's for the few. It's for like those Christians, right? And you're not one of those Christians, right? They've got a gift. I want to suggest today, against this backdrop that the author sets up for us, I believe that hearing God is a wonderful privilege. I don't think it's something that we're entitled to. I think it's a wonderful privilege. But I think it's a wonderful privilege that is meant to be a regular privilege. And I want to contend for that and stir us to that end. Stir up an appetite and a hunger to hear from God. Move you past maybe some of your fears. And into a posture of wanting to hear from Him. All of us, from the front to the back, Jesus said, My sheep will hear my voice. Part of, it, part of what it means to be part of his flock is to hear his voice. Not just to be led by Christian values, but to be led by his voice. All of them. All of my sheep hear my voice. He doesn't even say, you know, after going to a workshop, you can maybe hear my voice. No, it just states it as fact. My sheep hear my voice. It's not for the super spiritual. It's not for the elite. I'm super thankful for Christian values. I do make decisions based on the values that I've been given. But let's not give up on the wonderful privilege of hearing his voice and asking him to speak into the situations that we find ourselves in. One of the things that I was challenged with this week in trying to describe God's voice and how to hear it is that we often with voices know more than we can tell. Do you know what I mean by that? That you know someone's voice, but you couldn't describe someone's voice. If I asked Mark, Mark, would you come up here? Yeah, it's like really, this is like really happening. It's for, he's... He's a little older, hard of hearing. You yeah. got to say it twice. Can't see very well. <laughs> so, I w you know, Mark and Kathleen have been married for how many years? For 43 years. It's amazing. Yeah. And would you say that you, like, know her well? Yes, I do. Like in the biblical sense? Yes, I do. Great. <laughs> I want you to, dis I mean, you, you've heard her every day of your life for the last 43 years. I want you to describe Kathleen's voice to us. Okay. <laughs> I better get this right. Um, her voice. Oh, wow. Okay. Is it a female voice? Yes, it is. It's a female voice, and it's a kind voice. And, uh, yeah. I'm not sure exactly how to define it or explain it. Um, would you know it if you heard it? Definitely. How long would it take for you to pick up on what you think to be her voice? Uh, maybe.
should be about three or four words. Thanks. <laughs> you can quickly recognize someone's voice. When asked to describe someone vo someone's voice, words just fail. The, you know, there, no one based on Mark's description would go, oh, I feel equipped to hear Kathleen's voice. <laughs> We'd all be like, kind? What does that mean? What kind of description is that? Oh, it's a kind voice. All right, great. We're going to do it. It's for all of us. And I think our prayer lives are dependent upon us, not just speaking with God and keeping that up, but hearing from him in order to have this ongoing conversation. There's a story in Numbers 11 that we won't turn to, but I believe it captures the heart of God. Moses is uh, leading the people of God and the spirit falls, not just on Moses, but a whole group of people. And a whole group of people starts prophesying. The whole group starts hearing from God in Numbers 11, and they start prophesying. And some of the guys come to Moses, and they're like, hey, that's your job. That's your job to hear from God and to say what God's saying. Should we tell the people to stop? Should we tell people to stop hearing from God and stop saying what God is saying? And Moses, I believe, captures the heart of God when he says, no, don't stop this. Oh, that everyone would hear the voice of God. Oh, that everyone would prophesy. This is the heart of our God, that everyone would do this. And it may look different for each one of us. It's not going to look the same. What we hear, how we hear how we communicate, but it is the heart of God that every one of us would be able to hear from God. I believe that. If you've read your Bible, um, you know that God is communicating. God is speaking. God is saying something. God is wanting to reveal himself. That becomes really clear as you read Scripture. Another thing that becomes really clear as you read your Bible is that there appears to be a hearing problem down here. And that's to say it like kindly in Kathleen's voice, right? There's a bit of a hearing problem that we've got going. Which is really interesting because the Bible seems to suggest that God's communicating. He's wanting to say something and the problem lies here with us. People's hearts have become calloused. The people of God have become disobedient. This is a theme that runs throughout the whole Bible. There's like people who are listening, but they're not listening. They're hearing, but they're not hearing. You probably have maybe heard something along these lines before. Stiff-necked is one of the descriptions of the situation down here. A stiff-necked group of people that he's trying to lead with his voice. So that means not innocently hard of hearing like Mark. What would you say? Not innocently hard of hearing, but willfully hard of hearing. I heard you, and I choose not to do what you've asked me to do. Paul writes to one New Testament church, and he says this as a warning today when you hear his voice. Today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. As they did in days like these Moses days. Today, when you hear his voice, please don't harden your heart. Amos chapter 8 has this incredible uh, passage that says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I... I'll send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water. You'll have all your physical needs met, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. It's possible to have all your physical needs met and be living in a famine. 
of God's word. And it's not that we don't have Bibles, that we don't actually have God's word, but it's that we're calloused. We're not responding to, we're not living in this type of ongoing conversation with God. And I think what's interesting about this is that we can uh, not know that we're living in a famine, not know that we're starved, not know that we're hungry, because so many other voices, so many other things are satisfying us. Good news, church. Great news from Hebrews 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets like Amos. And he spoke to them at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. God has spoken clearest to us through the life of Christ. And he's spoken to us in this time through the life of Christ. But we still have an opportunity to tune in or to tune out. We can still harden our hearts to his voice. That's why Jesus during his earthly ministry was always looking for people who had ears to hear. And he wasn't saying, well, there's some people in the crowd who have physical ears. And there are other people in the crowd who do not have physical ears. He wasn't looking for people who had physical ears. He was looking for people who had a posture of heart where they were listening and obeying what they heard. He was looking for a type of listening so that he could share what was going, what was going on for him. There's this famous passage in Revelation that's often used as a reference for evangelism. It's Revelation 3.20 where Jesus himself says, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. And so the evangelist would appeal. Jesus stands at the door of your unbelieving heart, knocking. Would you tonight let him in? Every head bowed. Put your hand up. Whatever whatever it, it was, right? So here's the deal. This is written to a church. This passage in Revelation 3 is written to church people. Not those people out there. But it's possible in here to leave him out there. To tune him in or to tune him out. Today, if you hear his voice, church, it's possible for a whole church to tune in to what Jesus is saying or to tune out. And he says for those who hear, Inside the church, for those who hear, let him in. I'll eat with you. I'll feast with you. There are tables. There are banquets. There's a spread that we know not of. There are better tables than the ones that we're eating at. If we'll hear and respond to his voice in our lives. So here we have it. I want to talk about hearing God and humility in this passage. I want to talk about hearing God in previous revelation. And I want to talk about hearing God and hard things. Hearing God and humility, the posture of humility. Then the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I I did not call, lie down. So he went and lie down. And the Lord called again Samuel and Samuel arose and went to Eli, here I am. This happened three times, and then the Lord came and stood, calling, just like he called the other time, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Here we have God audibly speaking. There is no mediation. God is speaking audibly to Samuel. This is a remarkable encounter recorded here. Samuel doesn't even know what's going on. And I want to make this point because I think it's powerful concerning the posture of our hearts in hearing God. When God wants to do something, he often starts with a child. When God wants to do something, he often starts with a child. 
And if God doesn't start with a child, he starts by asking someone to have childlike faith and trust like a child. That's how God begins to move. I think the be- it was, it was um, portrayed in our worship. Starts with a child, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. That is who you are, and I'm going to take you at your word. If it's not that that he moves through, he moves through someone saying, it is well with my soul, and trusting, even though they can't see, trusting like a child. When God wants to move, he moves through a child, or an adult that he's asking to step out and risk in childlike faith. That's how he moves. Which can be tough for us because of the disappointment and the cynicism that comes with the weather, right? I was thinking about the angel appearing to Mary and saying to this young girl, some think between 14 and 16 years old, Mary, the mother of Jesus, an angel appearing and saying, you're going to be pregnant and you're going to be pregnant with God. Whoa. Okay. And then Mary's response as a young woman is, Lord, be it to me according to your word. Another angel appears in the story to Zechariah. He's been a priest. He's been a priest for a long time. He's been married and trying to get pregnant for a lot of years. The angel appears and says, you're going to have a child. And Zechariah goes, yeah, I heard that before. (laughs) Then the angel says to him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. You think I make stuff up? Am I making stuff up here? And if you know the story, he goes mute. But what's the difference between that 14-year-old girl and that 64-year-old man, let's say? A lot of years of trying to get pregnant. A lot of disappointment. And that passion had become cynicism. Hear this. The childlike are more likely to hear. The childlike are more likely to hear. Part of the expression of humility in Samuel's life here is to say, I need the people of God in order to hear God no matter how broken they are. Eli, if you read the story, is not an upstanding dude. Part of the innocence, part of the humility of Samuel is to say, I need the people of God to help me hear the word of God, no matter how flawed they are. The voice of God for us can sound and often sounds a lot like the voice of others. The voice of God. I know I've left lunches before where I only spoke with a person and had a sense I heard from God as I spoke with them. The word of God can sound a lot like the voice of another person. And so we need people in our lives. And that's the posture of humility to hear him. Samuel assumed it was Eli. And Eli's like, no, it's, it's not. The other thing I want to say concerning humility in our posture is the voice of God can at times be so still and so small that you'll need others to help you to discern it. And that requires a posture of humility. Hmm. Let me say it this way. You need to be a beginner to hear God's voice. You need to be a beginner and you need to stay a beginner in order to hear God's voice. Pride is the pitfall of those who've heard from God. Some of the proudest people in the world are people who at one point heard from God. And there's no longer a posture of humility because they're laying down the trump card of what God said. The posture of humility that it's conducive to hearing God requires that we need others around us to discern God's voice. I've run into a fair share of people who would say, I don't need this, it's just me and Jesus. No mediation, he just speaks directly to me, and I don't submit that to the people around me. I don't think that God will speak to that person for very long because God opposes pride. He gives grace to the humble. Well, I don't need a pastor. I don't need a person. 
Listen, Eli's broken. And I don't need an Eli in my life. I don't need a pastor. I have a podcast. I hear from God on the podcast. Oh, I don't know about all that. I love the posture of Samuel. I'll learn from you. You're like dim. Your eyesight's gone out. This temple's not going in a great direction, I'll be honest. I'll learn from you. I need you to help me hear God. I'll take all the correction I can get. You can and you should learn from everyone and you should stay a beginner to hear from God. Hearing from God in previous revelation. So the Lord says to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel. It's going to make everyone's ears, their ears tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I've spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I'll declare to him that I'm about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew. Because his sons were blaspheming God. And he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Listen, God speaks to Samuel in this brand new way. So fresh, so brand new that Samuel doesn't even know it's God speaking. So fresh, so new that he doesn't even know it's God. But listen. Listen. When the word of the Lord comes, it comes to fulfill what's already been spoken. When God speaks in this brand new way, it's according to previous revelation. It's in order to fulfill what's already been promised. No, I'm about to do this thing right now, but it's according to what's already been said. And it's according to the blaspheme that's ha- blasphemy that's happening with Eli's sons. And they know it's blasphemy because I've written it. It's been recorded. It's according to my word. They know that they're out of bounds. So this new word that comes from God, this hearing from God, is in light of previous revelation or according to previous revelation or in order to fulfill previous revelation. The scriptures are the surest way for us to hear from God. Everything has to be according to what's been already written. Everything has to be in order to fulfill what's already been written in God's word. The Bible itself says that people are going to hear God in other ways. It's not that you only hear God through scripture. Scripture says that you'll hear God in other ways. You'll hear him audibly. You'll hear him through dreams and visions. You'll hear him in nature. You'll hear him through others that God's put in authority. Sometimes you just know things and you don't know why you know it. And you wouldn't even claim you heard something. You just know it and you're knower. (laughs) Sometimes it's through the counsel of others. There's all these ways that we hear from God. But we come back to his written word and go, is this in fulfillment of previous revelation? Is this according to what God has already written and revealed about himself? We take this brand new revelation and we subject it to previous revelation in order to keep ourselves from strapping bombs on ourselves. One encouragement would be here for you. Would you let the scriptures start a conversation and would prayer be your response? So the idea is that we don't just read the Bible. The Bible's living and active. So the Bible reads us. And we don't just read it. We pray our way through it. And would you let what you read start a conversation? Would you let the word of God be what initiates a conversation in your prayer be a response so that we know that what we're hearing is in light of previous revelation. Lastly, hearing God in hard things. Samuel just lay there until morning. It says that he didn't sleep. You want to know why he didn't sleep? Well, this was not, a, this was not an easy word to deliver. This is really difficult. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. And then Eli had to call him out and say, no, say what God said. 
Say what God said and don't withhold any of it. Samuel thought, oh, you're, you're going to be sorry you said that. But he followed through. And his posture here, the reason he grew and the reason we'll grow in hearing God is because we fear the Lord. We don't fear people. And he pushed through in courage and he shared or said what God had said to him. That's what happened. And it says that Samuel grew in posture. Samuel grew in his ability to hear God and obey because he didn't shrink back from what God said. He followed through with a tough word and it demonstrated courage. It's a huge privilege to hear God. But the question is, do you really want to hear him? And if you do want to hear God, what I would say is just buckle up. Buckle up. Strap in. Hold on. Oh, God, I want to hear you. How many of you have been caught in a relationship, probably with your spouse, saying, no, I want to know. No, like, really, like, how does that make you feel? And then, like, ten seconds in, you're like, well, that's enough. That's enough of how you feel. I mean, I want you to be honest, but not that honest. Shush, you know. Just immediate defensiveness. Oh, God, would you speak to me? Oh, got to go. He doesn't talk to me. Are you sure? Or do you just not want to hear what he has to say? Sometimes, most of the time I hear God, he says this to me. You know. Boo, bummer. And there's a deep sense inside where it's like, he didn't even have to say anything. It was like he just looks at you like, we've been over this. I think Samuel was probably thinking, well, I didn't even want to hear God. <laughs> I think he was probably thinking, I didn't even, I didn't even ask for this. I don't, I don't actually even want this in my life right now. I don't want to share this news with Eli. So he just laid there all night. He didn't sleep. Because sometimes God says hard things. And the question is, will you not just listen, will you obey? God tends to speak to that person who acts. The idea of listening and obeying are so intertwined in Hebrew that it's the same word. As if to say, there's no other option than to obey if you heard God. Like, no, I heard, and now I'm not going to obey. They're one word in Hebrew. If you, heard, if you hear, you obey. Samuel follows through, and he's entrusted with more, and he grows as a prophet, right? Sometimes he's going to say hard things. Say this. I don't want to say that. Do this. I don't want to do that. Apologize. Nope. Move. I'm so What? Surrender. Give. Do we really want to hear him? So how will we do this? Like if this is really hard and God says hard things, not just the things we want him to say. He says things that we would have rather him not say. How are we going to do this? Well, the key is simple. We, we trust in the greater Samuel. We trust in Jesus. This is how we do the hard things that we're asked to do and obey the things we're asked to obey. Listen, Samuel had a long night in prayer. He had a long, lonely night knowing he had to do something the next day that he didn't want to do. Which was what? Deliver a word of judgment on Eli's house. A long night, not looking forward to the next day because he had to deliver a word of judgment. Jesus also had a long, lonely night. Not looking forward to what he had to do the next day. Wishing that he didn't have to be obedient to what God said. Because the following day, he wouldn't just deliver a word of judgment. 
he would receive God's judgment in and on himself. For a bunch of people who are calloused in their hearts, stiff-necked enemies who wanted nothing to do with him. It wasn't that people were cheering him on, be our champion, be our champion. They wanted nothing to do with him. And he did this, was delivered over to judgment so that we could say we'll never walk alone. We'll never go, no matter what God asks you to do, you won't go without God. No matter what he says to you, God will be with you because of the lonely night that Jesus had and because of his obedience to God's voice. You'll never go without him. So when God says to you, you need to stop the affair and come clean, you should know you're going to go with God. When God says to you, I want you to step out and be baptized publicly. Oh, I really don't like talking in front of people. You'll be with God. When God says give and give more generously, you won't be doing that without him. Because of the way that Jesus made for us. When God says reconcile with that person, you, you won't go without God. The greater Samuel is going with you having taken upon himself the judgment that was due to us. Take that cut and pay. Change your career. It's killing you. You won't go without God if you respond to that. Start chemo. You'll never go without God because of what God did for us through Christ. We said that speaking to God was not the end, but a means to an end. Speaking with God is a means to know him. It's the same with hearing from God. Hearing from God is not a means to know what job we're to take next. Hearing from God is not a means to do anything else. Hearing from God is a means to know God. To know what's on his heart. Would you stand and we'll pray? Lord, I want to ask that you would be Lord. We like to say sometimes that you're the most important uh, thing in our lives. But then when you ask us to do something about what's really the most important thing in our lives, we want to dodge those words. So I just want to pray over your people great boldness and great joy as they hear your voice. It says for John the Baptist that his joy was made complete when he heard from you. And he heard from you that his ministry was coming to an end. And he still was like, I'm thrilled that God is speaking. Lord, we recognize that our hearts are calloused. That there's some hard spots. And you have some hard things to say to us. But we trust you like children. We want to believe again in you, Father. We want to contend for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. Stir an appetite and a hunger in your people to hear from you. And would you satisfy our hearts? Thank you, Jesus, for making a way for us to have this type of relationship with our Father. Thank you for always being with us and not forsaking us. Would you speak to your people in Jesus' name? Amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. And I